Hey, Cider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. Iowa, state of Iowa last night, passed a bill banning mask mandates. You can still wear a mask if you want, but you can't force your delusions on me. Beautiful. Well done, Iowa. Well done. The mask mandates, especially on kids, and that's the main focus I want to uh, do on this segment here. It's based on bad science. This is from New York Magazine, okay? The source is important. New York Magazine, not a bastion of conservative thought. New York Magazine, you ready? The reported number of COVID hospitalizations among kids was grossly inflated for children in California hospitals. Two research papers concluded on uh, Wednesday. The papers, both published in the journal Hospital Pediatrics, found that pediatric hospitalizations for COVID were overcounted by at least 40%. That's in California. There's no reason to believe that that's not true in every other state as well. So the number of kids in hospital uh, because of COVID inflated by at least 40%. Here's the bottom line with this. There is, a, and anyone with two brain cells can understand this and has understood this for a long time. And now we have the, the proof and even New York Magazine admitting it. There's a difference between, and this is true for adults or kids, but there's a difference between a kid in the hospital with COVID and a kid in the hospital because of COVID. And for the last 16 months, no one ever made that distinction. So a kid goes to the ER because his appendix is about to burst. He goes to the ER, they test him for COVID. Gee, wouldn't you know it, he has COVID. Weird, he doesn't even know it. He's asymptomatic, he's not, he doesn't have the sniffles, but he's got COVID. He's marked down as a pediatric COVID patient. He didn't go to the hospital because of COVID, he just happened to have it and no one even knew. That's why the number of kids in the hospital from COVID is inflated by 40, 50%. Pretty amazing, right? These numbers, which were tiny to begin with, even if you did, even the inflated numbers were still small, but these numbers were the justification for no school, no sporting events, no activities, no birthdays, no church youth events, no summer camps, nothing with kids. And it was based on a lie. The hospital, this is New York Magazine, the hospitalization numbers for children was already extremely low relative to adults. At the peak for kids, it was 10 times lower than uh, people 18 to 49 and 77 times lower than those aged 65 and, plus, uh, 65 and on. Uh, but cutting the pediatric numbers by nearly half is a striking difference, making the actual rates vanishingly small. Again, that's New York Magazine, vanishingly small. Stop it with the kids. Stop messing around with the kids in COVID. Knock it off. Take masks off kids. John Tierney, former science writer at the New York Times, uh, a man who has absolutely earned my trust over the years. He wrote a great article on taking masks off kids, and he quoted Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And Tierney says, by that standard, our society now has the soul of an abusive parent. The pandemic has turned American adults, or at least the ones who make the rules, into selfish neurotics who have been punishing innocent children for over a year and still can't restrain themselves. What we are doing to children is cruel. Adults are supposed to calm children's fears, to reassure children that there are no monsters under the bed. Instead, we spent the last year plus unnecessarily frightening them, telling them they're filthy disease vectors. You're gonna kill grandma, kid. And also when you go outside, watch out for that invisible death virus lurking in the air wherever you go at your favorite playground or whatever. Don't breathe. The heck's wrong with us? Cuomo just yesterday announced uh, even uh, masking policies and vaccination mandates for kids at summer camp. Two years old and up, you still gotta wear a mask outside. And I just mentioned there, vaccinating kids. <laughs> uh, this is a very simple question. A very simple question. Let me calm it down. Okay, vaccinating kids. From what? From what threat? They're now testing the vaccine on six-month-olds. First of all, who would give, who would go, who, who would put their six-month-old in a trial for this vaccine? Like, what in the world? But even if it's, even once the trials are done or whatever, like, why would you, why, why would you give your six-month-old this vaccine? Your kids are not at risk from COVID. 
I read one doctor, he was published in a, a British medical journal. He said that vaccines and kids should not get the emergency youth auth use authorization. So right now the vaccine's not FDA approved technically. It's not the full FDA approval. It has an emergency use authorization because it was an emergency. Like we gotta get this vaccine out to as many people as possible without necessarily going through the full, uh, with enough, the usual amount of time that a vaccine must be tested. Right? Fine, I'm all for that, that's great. But an emergency use authorization should only be given when what it's treating is serious and life-threatening. COVID is not serious or life-threatening to kids. It's not. So it should, it does not deserve, it does not reach the standard of needing, of necessitating uh, emergency use, author, use authorization. And listen, I wanna be clear, I'm pro, I'm pro this vaccine if you're an adult and you want a microchip in you, no, oh, no, come on. That's not helpful, Slade. If you're an adult and you want it, great. Uh, I'm pro all other vaccines. My kids are vaccinated. No way are they getting this one. <laughs> there's no way. It's not happening. Because there's no risk from COVID. <laughs> they're not getting it. They're not spreading it. They maybe have already had it. We don't even know it. And anyone else who is vulnerable is vaccinated. So why would I put something in my kid for no reason? I'm not doing it, it's not happening. So I'm on team Novax, for, for, the, for kids at least. Uh, worth noting as well, and this is a different situation, but I don't know, maybe it's not that long ago. Uh, the polio vaccine, 1955, they first started giving it and a month later they stopped, they put the kibosh on it. 200,000 kids were given this vaccine. It was manufactured in Berkeley, California. It's called the, the Cutter Incident. If you wanna check it up yourself, check it out yourselves. 200,000 kids were given the vaccine. Uh, this is like right out of the gate, right? 200,000 kids, 40,000 of them got polio. So a good quarter of them got polio. 200 kids were paralyzed and 10 of them died. <laughs> Rut row. So they stopped it right away, back to the drawing board. Now, we're better than we are in 1955. There's no doubt about that, right? But why force any risk on our kids when it's entirely unnecessary? What's wrong with the adults who are doing this? One last point on vaccines. This is for kids and adults. I hear all this talk about like a vaccine passport or you need to prove that you're vaccinated in order to go back to work or to go on a train or airport or whatever, right? You gotta prove you've been vaccinated. Where's your vaccination card, right? I don't hear anyone talking about antibodies. An antibody meaning if you've had COVID and you've recovered, you now have antibodies, which is what the vaccines do. The vaccines give you the antibodies without actually getting COVID. But if you've already had COVID and you have the antibodies, we're at the same place at the end. It's just as effective as the vaccine. So why, if you've already had COVID and you have the antibodies, why do we need the government or your work to force you to get the vaccine to get the antibodies that you already have? So all this talk about you need to prove you've been vaccinated, they also, we also need to start talking about, okay, sure, prove you're vaccinated, although you shouldn't even have to do that, but okay, if you're gonna have to prove you're vaccinated, then at least also let us prove that I have antibodies. Does that make sense? You go donate blood at your local blood bank, they'll run that antibody test for free. And that should be true for kids too, right? You're not vaccinating my kids, but I'll do a blood test. You can give them a blood test and, and they'll prove that they have antibodies so they don't need a vaccination, right? I don't hear anyone talking about that. I don't wanna get that out there. Uh, it's not just kids though, right? Everyone's lost their minds and needs to get it together quick because the, the, the senile are only going to get more senile. This is Mika Brzezinski on MSNBC Morning Joe. Joe Scarborough starts off saying we got to take our masks off and go back to normal and here's Mika's response. I'm here in Washington uh, in many ways. I'm here doing Know Your Value interviews but I am working with a team here and there is one person on the team who is not vaccinated. I'm wearing a mask around that person. You know it is really if you want to follow the science then there are times you need to still wear the mask. Mika, why are you wearing a mask around that person? Why are you doing that? Let's say there's five people, right? And all of them are vaccinated except for one. There's one person not vaccinated. I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious, like, what are you concerned about? Okay, so let's, as, let's assume that masks do anything, okay? What, what are you concerned about? Are, are, are you concerned about infecting the unvaccinated person? Right, are you, are you wearing a mask for that person's safety? You don't need to. You're vaccinated, you don't have it, you're not spreading it. They're fine. 
they could be vaccinated by now if they wanted. They're assuming the risk. They know. Right? They're not vaccinated for a reason. So fine. On behalf of all not vaccinated people, right? On behalf of team anti-vax, don't worry about us. <laughs> We're good. Now, if you're worried about that person being sick and infecting you, well, you don't have to be worried about that either. They don't have COVID, most likely. But even if they did, they're, and even if they were shedding enough virus, you're vaccinated, so you won't get sick. So assuming masks are this like form of protection, why, why even do that? You're protected. You're fine. So I, I don't get that at all. And, and we're going to have to call people out on that appropriately, kindly, curiously. Like, what are you, what are you, why are you wearing a mask exactly? Let me end with this. Um, the other day we did a segment, I think on Monday, there's three groups of people who are still wearing masks. The prideful, the people who don't want to admit they're wrong, uh, cult members, and the mentally ill. New York Times had a story of a man who, when he goes grocery shopping, he puts on an N95 mask, a neck gaiter, over that, and then he wears goggles. He wears goggles. He's been doing this the whole time. And he said he plans to do his grocery shopping uh, double masked and goggled for at least the next five years. <laughs> All right? I don't want to be rude. That man is mentally ill. Like, he's got a it's, a, it's a mental illness. It's a mental illness. It's an anxiety disorder. It's something that is categorized under mental illness. There's no rational thinking there. And I read that story, and I, and I, I had a flashback to uh, when I was in high school, and I was sick, and I stayed home and watched the Maury Povich show. Maury Povich always had like these themes of shows, right? Like you have like the, uh, like are you, you're not the father, right? That's one. And then uh, another great theme was like troubled kids. And then they bring in like the Marine uh, boot camp instructor to scare them straight. That was always good. But my favorite theme in the Maury Povich show was when he'd bring in people with weird phobias, right? Like here's a girl who's scared of pickles. Here's a girl scared of cotton balls. One episode they had a, a guy, someone scared of cotton balls. And some guy came out from backstage covered in cotton balls. He was like one giant cotton ball running out. I mean, come on. That's great TV. So I looked up Maury Phobia, and this is the first video I saw. I did not search for this. This was the first one that popped up. Here it is. There's a woman named Tara. And Tara's fanning herself because she's having trouble catching her breath because she knows that within a few minutes, she has to come face to face with her worst fear, frogs. I do not like frogs, period. My fear is when frogs pee on me, I will turn into a witch with warts on my hands, the nose grows long, the face just gets terrible. Don't show me a picture of, of the frog. Ah! Tara, are you all right? Huh? Hey, 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 it's okay, it's okay, okay. You want to, you want, you want to get over this, don't you? Huh? Yes. You don't want to live your life like this. No. Okay, so is the guy who double masks and goggles for the next five years, is he any different than that woman? I'm serious. I feel like going to the guy and being like, more be like, hey, 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 come on, hey, snap it. You don't, you don't want to live like this, do you? Hey, come on, come on, come on. You don't want to, this is not, right? That episode, I watched the rest of that video. It ends with uh, the triumphant, uh, finale and it, there's another guy on the show who is scared of something else and it says Sean says he's crippled uh, he's conquered his crippling fear of peaches and he's up on stage eating a peach and the whole crowd is cheering like he's like some hero right these people have a mental illness if you've been vaccinated you have a 0.0005% chance of getting sick from COVID you have a 0.0001% chance of dying I saw another episode of Maury where she was scared of pickles you have a way higher chance of choking to death on a pickle today than you do if you're vaccinated dying from COVID. I'm not kidding, you have a way higher chance of dying from a pickle. That person who's scared of frogs is more rational than the guy who's scared of COVID and wearing goggles at the grocery store. I feel like that woman would meet that guy who's goggled and be like, hey man, you, like, you gotta relax. <laughs> you're, you're losing your mind. You gotta, what are you scared of, man? Why are you scared of nothing? Says the lady scared of pickles. Who think, and the lady thinks she's gonna turn into a witch if she touches a frog. That lady is more rational than the guy scared of COVID. It's, uh, listen, I, uh, <laughs> I mock these people, part of them, does, a lot of them deserve it for their uh, fear and panic. But a lot of these same people on the left mock preppers. Right? There's a term for that, preppers. 
the left, they mock preppers for being so crazy for preparing for a natural disaster or a riot or a stock market crash or hyperinflation. Well, who's laughing now? As these other people are, are standing in line at the grocery store all day to buy scraps. Everyone's running around screaming like chickens with their heads cut off in full panic mode. You're home, safe, fully fed with your family. And that's always how it works, right? Right? They laugh at you, and then before you know it, they're begging you for some <laughs> to spare some extra. And we will. But everyone will know who the person is who's prepared. You'll be known as the dad, the father, the husband who's prepared. My Patriot Supply is the best preparedness company there is. Uh, over 12 years, millions of families, including me, uh, have been helped by My Patriot Supply. And I, I got My Patriot Supply because I'm a dad, and that's what dads do. I'm a husband, and that's what husbands do. They prepare for their families. They prepare their families, right? So we can stay safe. Special website for you, preparewiththefirst.com. Among other deals, you get $50 off your first four weeks of an uh, emergency food kit. Preparewiththefirst.com. They have over 2,000 calorie per day meals. No brand comes close to that. It's My Patriot Supply, preparewiththefirst.com. Hey, Slater Crusaders. Do you trust big tech? Do you trust these people with anything? These people in San Francisco, they control what you see and how you see it. We were just talking during the break here. You know, we kicked off the show with uh, the Iowa governor uh, passed a law that bans mask mandates in schools and universities. So it just went on Twitter, and one of the trending things is hashtag COVID Kim. So I clicked, what is that? Oh, okay, that's the governor of Iowa. And all the comments that pop up are... People talk about how negligent this is. This is abusive. It's horrific. It's horrible. They say they're pro. Like, there's a thousand person with a thousand followers. The first thing that popped up talks about how uh, you say you're pro life, yet you're not protecting our babies from COVID. I mean, guys, we just talked about in the last segment, right? This is what big tech does, right? They control what you see, how you see it. They have a worldview completely antithetical to yours. They have way too much power and they use it. In this case, uh, the story I want to talk about here, not just how you see certain things, but even how you, forcing you to talk in certain ways. Google yesterday announced they have a new operating system, a new predictive text feature that is gender inclusive. So you know the predictive text, if you're writing an email or sending a text or whatever, it'll, it'll predict what you're about to say, or a Google search predicts what you think may be next, they may think may be next. So no more mailman, it's a mail carrier. No more chairman, it's chairperson. Okay, but then also they're no longer gonna predict he or she. It will no longer predict the gender of the person that you're referring to earlier in the email or whatever. Now, you may look at this and say it's silly. Here's my response to that. They don't think so. You can laugh it off, they're not. They're doing it for a reason, they think it's important. Google wants to make sure you're woke and that you fall in line. Why? Because there are people in San Francisco with a very, with a worldview, and they're going to force you to have it. All right, let's back it up here. The left always wants to control language. All right, this was just a couple weeks ago. This is Cori Bush. She's a congressperson, congress, congresswoman, dare I say, uh, on the uh, floor of the House. Uh, see if you notice an oh, odd word used. I am committed to doing the absolute most to protect black mothers, to protect black babies, to protect protect black birthing people and to save lives. <laughs> birth, birth, birthing people? You know what that is? That's a trans inclusive term because it includes pregnant men. Men who get pregnant and who give birth. They're known as birthing people. Are you with me on how insane these people are? But it's not just her. This is uh, Harvard Med School. Uh, globally, Ethnic minority pregnant and birthing people suffer worse outcomes. But that's Harvard Med School now using birthing people. Okay, so why control the language? 
If you control people's language, the words that can and can't be said, then you control people's thoughts. And when you control their thoughts, you can control how every issue is viewed and therefore their actions. The classic example is abortion, right? People who want to kill babies in the womb, they're not called pro-death. They're not called pro-murder. They're not called pro-crushing baby skulls. It's pro-choice. It's pro-women. Right? It's a perfect example. The left literally changed the definition of court packing. Like, dictionary.com changed the definition of court packing a couple months ago. Court packing used to mean adding judges to the court, adding the number of judges. Now it means changing the political makeup of the court. Right? They did that lockstep with the Democratic Party. The dictionary changed the definition in real time. It was amazing. George Or Orwell obviously wrote about this, not only in his dystopian book, 1984, but also in an essay called Politics in the English Language. You need to uh, read it. He said, if thoughts can corrupt language, think about this, if thoughts can corrupt language, so if you have bad thoughts, it can corrupt your language, he says, then language can also corrupt your thoughts. And the left knows that. So they change your language to corrupt your thoughts. In the dystopian book, 1984, the government created language to limit your ability to think. And I say created language. They didn't really create language. They eliminated words. They want to limit your ability to think. That's why they did it. Let me, before we bring in our next guest, let me finish up this point. So again, we're talking about the importance of language and and uh, watch your language and, and think, think clearly and, and notice when people are changing words, changing definitions of words, adding, making up new words, birthing persons, et cetera. Uh, I was reading the biography of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and came across this example here. This is, to me, the clearest example of, of changing definitions and the subtleness of it, which then snowballs into something much more serious. So the Nazis had to change, they had to make the Bible anti-Semitic. So they started off just changing a couple words. So Matthew 21, 13 says, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers, or maybe you've heard den of thieves. The Nazis changed that to department store. Why are you making it a department store? Why'd they do that? Because most of the department stores were owned by Jews. So they had to make that a bad thing. They got rid of all the things that were too Jewish in the Bible, including the Old Testament, but also just all the words, Jehovah, hallelujah, Hosanna, anything Hebrew, gone. Jerusalem was changed to heavenly abode. The term cedars of Lebanon was changed to furs of the German forest. At first, the Nazi Christian church, in quotes, embraced Jesus as the ultimate Aryan man, even though he was Jewish himself, but then obviously they had to get rid of Jesus entirely because he was Jewish. They changed baptism from uh, into the body of Christ to in the community of the Volk, the people. Then they took sin out of the Bible entirely because haven't the German people been through enough with World War I? We don't need to tell them they're a bunch of sinners. We need to encourage the German people. So they took sin out of the Bible. So you see, it starts off small, right? One little word here. Oh, let's just change that to department store. And before you know it, Jesus is not even in it and the Germans can't sin and the Bible justifies genocide. Amazing, right? Victor uh, Klemper. He was a German Jew around this time, and he wrote a book uh, afterwards called The Language of the Third Reich, and uh, he had this quote about language. He said, the sole purpose of the Nazi use and form of language is to strip everyone of their individuality, to paralyze them as personalities, to make them into unthinking and docile cattle in a herd, driven and hounded in a particular direction, and to turn them into atoms in a huge rolling block of stone. Uh, we'll talk more about that another day. I wanted to get to... Um, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink project, uh, which is like as dystopian of a thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> we'll save that uh, for next week because I want to get to our next guest, which actually ties in pretty good because we know what our schools have become here in America. And they were designed as a thing to uh, make everyone uniform and uh, one size fits all, a very assembly line-esque. Uh, and our public schools are an absolute disaster. There's another way and we need to always highlight the other ways Really good schools, global lessons for high caliber, low cost education. James Tooley is the author. Mr. Tooley, how are you, sir? It's great to be on here, Mike. Good to meet you. Really good, to, great to talk to you. I wanna focus on the, because um, whenever we talk about education reform, whatever, the first thing we always hear back is, okay, sure, that's great for the rich. The rich can do private schools, whatever. 
but we need public schools for the poor, uh, for the low income. What can we learn from the world when it comes to educating low income people? Yeah, we, we've got so much to learn from the rest of the world. In developing countries, in the global south, let's call it that, um, we, we've got this extraordinary revolution taking place. The poorest people on this planet, in the slums of Lagos in Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Nairobi in Kenya, Accra in Ghana, even Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai in India, um, the, the poorest people are not going to public schools, as the Americans call them. They're not going to, to state schools. Um, they are going to low-cost private schools. These schools are, are affordable to the poor. They outperform children in these low-cost private schools, outperform those in government schools. There are literally hundreds of thousands of these schools, 450,000 in India alone. And it's this amazing good news story, first of all, for those involved in development, an amazing good news story from the rest of the world. But the question you asked was really pertinent. What can we learn from that? Well, we first of all, the answer to your question that you raised um, is, is private education just for the rich? Is that choice of private education just for the elite, for the better off? Absolutely not. The lesson from India and Ghana and Nigeria shows us that the the, 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 these schools can be for everyone. That's really exciting. Can, can you paint a picture of what these schools look like? Let's focus on these Indian or African schools. What do they look like? I want to be able to visualize it. And then what goes on in them that makes them so effective that we can learn from? Yeah, so the, the, these schools, I mean, they're, they're a huge range and India is different from Africa. But if you're thinking about the poorest of the poor, let's go in, I'll take you into some of the slums in Monrovia in Liberia or the slums in Lagos in, in, in Nigeria. You'll, you'll, you'll go down, you know, little, little alleyways through the mud. There's open drains everywhere. There, there may be some taps or whatever for water, people collecting water from there, but open drains, muddy, dirty and then you'll find a little school which is perhaps a you know a, a brick building or a mud building a, a, a made from concrete blocks perhaps with a thatch roof possibly but inside now this is the very important point inside you go in there and you'll find teachers teaching they'll be teaching in a very traditional way largely there, there might be rote learning of tables and mathematics or you know the, the english teaching will be very much based on phonics and understanding There'll be teaching going on. The teachers will be there. They'll be young. They'll be enthusiastic. They'll be energetic. The head teacher, the entrepreneur who runs the school, will be looking around, making sure things go on. And the important reason why are these schools better? Than what go because well, for two reasons. One is you go into the government schools. I, I, the first government school I went to in this sort of situation, the pu first public school, 130 kids sitting on the floor in a nice building, actually, but doing nothing. Parents said their children, if they send them to the public school, are abandoned. Whereas in the private schools, the teaching is going on, the teaching is lively and energetic, and the kids are learning. And that's really important. That's, so there's this, if you like, accountability through people paying small fees. That We're talking $5 a month, something like that for these schools in, in, in Africa and India, 5 to $10 a month. The teachers are teaching, but the other important thing, and this might resonate even more with your listeners in America, the schools deliver what the parents want. And what do the parents want for their children? They want to become their children to become literate and numerate. They want them to be able to work hard, to be disciplined, not to be fogged off with lots of politically correct nonsense, what we call the woke agenda now. They want them to be uh, learning stuff that can help them get a job. And so their schools are accountable to the parents in that way too. So there's a very exciting lesson here. And I'm not saying this school model can be translated immediately to America, of course not. But the principle, I think, can be translated very easily across to America and to England, where Without I'm speaking from now. Without a doubt. Who runs these schools in India and Africa? Who's making the money? Who puts them together? And, and how big are they? Like, Do they have an administration, or are they more like one-room schoolhouses? So they they can be the one room schoolhouses but more typically they are they are um simple you know mom and pop like the mom and pop stores that you used to have in america i guess but a simple 
a, a school, maybe in a house, maybe in the sort of building I described, but, you know, it, it recognizably a school. There will be classrooms, there will be an office, there'll be possibly a computer lab, there'll be a playground. Um, so you can definitely recognize it as a school. There's no question there. Yeah. Go to one of these places, you'll see a school. Um, they're run by, you know, the, the people from the community themselves, the entrepreneurs from the, within the community, perhaps the better educated ones from within the slums or adjoining the slums. They will, you know, parents will ask them, look, we need a school, you, you open a school for us, and they will, they will do that. There are many of these schools, and they serve the majority. This is a very important point. Um, in, in, in the slums of Lagos, in the slums of Kampala, in Uganda, Nairobi, in Kenya, Accra, in Ghana, Monrovia, in Liberia, 70 plus percent of poor children are in private school. Let that figure sink in. The majority, the vast majority. In rural areas, it's probably 30 percent. And the same is true in India, in India, in Delhi, in Mumbai, in Hyderabad. Um, the same figure is true. This is an enormous phenomenon going on across the world. Public education is being a, a you know, a public education abandons children and parents are abandoning their voting their feet and going somewhere else. <laughs> That's amazing. 70 percent. That's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. It um, is. And that's just not, that, you know, those are my figures originally, but lots of other people are coming up with the same figures now. Yeah. What would you say? And this is a big question, but where did the public education system in America and perhaps in England? I'm not sure the similarities or differences, but at least in America, where did it go wrong or, or what? And we can, I, I like it to go back to the root, right? And, you know, we've talked before about Dewey, who is the, known as the father of the education system and just his worldview as to what, what the public school should be. So I don't know, what, what was the worldview that made it start awry or what made it go awry to really just the failure that it is now? We talked about a school the other day that, you know, 2% of the kids know how to read and write at grade level. I mean, they're abject failures. So when did that happen? Yeah, look, look I, I, I'm, I don't want to outstep, you know, what I know for sure. So this is, this is now, again, I, I'll speculate a little bit. But isn't it true once government gets involved in things, you know, these things start moving away from the people that, that they should be accountable to? This is true of any nationalised industry, isn't it? You can talk about the tele... I mean, I can talk, think of what the nationalised industries were in England. They were the telephones, they were the airlines... They, they, the water, all these things were nationalized, the railways, and they didn't work well. And they start, you know, getting involved in extraneous things rather than focusing on what the parents want and what the, um, you know, what the, what the children will benefit from. So once you've got, you know, in, in America, you know, was it 1821? In, in Britain, we've, in England, we've had 150 years of state education. There's a lot of time for a lot of things to go wrong. And that slow movement away from a school being what parents are paying for, accountable to parents, to a place where children have to go. Compulsion is there, where parents have to send their children, otherwise they get fined or worse, imprisoned, where um, teachers are not focused on what children want to learn. They're just focused on perhaps their own predilections or what their teacher training universities and colleges say should be there. Slowly, you move away from what parents want. And, and the really important thing, I think, is I've, I've described what's happening in developing countries. And the extraordinary thing was we get a sense this was happening in England and America, at least the, the states we know about, New York and Massachusetts, it was happening there before the state got involved. Um, schooling in New York State, for example, was nearly universal by 1821. There's a report from the, the New York, uh, the superintendent of common schools of the state of New York by 1821, pointing out that virtually every child was in school for how many years? For uh, 11 years. Um, and that was before it was compulsory and before it was free. So parents won, and in England, it was it, it, the Newcastle Commission report of 1861 was reporting from very good studies done in 1858. The majority of kids, 95% of kids, were in school for six years before the state got involved. Some small subsidies. So you know what we're seeing. What we're seeing in India and Africa was there in America and England. The state gets involved. The state messes up. <laughs> the state destroys. Yeah. The state corrupts. Yeah, I think of yeah, you know, I think of Thomas Jefferson or um, 
more George Washington and Abraham Lincoln just learning how to read and write on dirt floors around a fireplace with no formal education and and, and look what they did, obviously, compared to what any of our, co- even high school or college graduates are able to do today. It's uh, quite a difference. Uh, the book is Really Good Schools, Global Lessons for High Caliber, Low Cost Education. James Tooley. James, thanks for your time, sir. I appreciate you. Have a great day, sir. Um, this is a good segue into uh, tomorrow's special, where we're going to be talking about not only, because you have two different things here. So first, you've got ab- just abject failure of our school systems. And we could talk about that all day long where you have no kids uh, in an entire school. It was like, I think it was two years ago or last year, Baltimore had, no, out of all their high schools in all of Baltimore, not a single student could read or write at grade level. Not, not one, there wasn't one kid, all right? In all of Baltimore, okay? That's a failure, that's a failure. The school system is a failure of culture as well. Uh, so we talk about that, but it's one thing to not teach kids how to read or write. It's another to then teach them critical race theory. It's to teach them to hate this country. And that's what we're going to talk about on tomorrow's special. Coming up next, uh, yesterday on the show, we talked about the lab leak theory that COVID came from a lab. Uh, and we talked about all the proof and all that and everything. Our next guest is going to talk about how if you said that last month, you'd be kicked off social media, laughed off the stage by all the major newspapers. We'll talk about that next. True story. Mike Slater, by the way. What, in your opinion, was the origin? of the virus? Um, This has been studied by the WHO. Um, Ma'am, I'm asking your opinion. I don't believe I've seen enough data, individual data, for me to be able to comment on that. What are the possibilities? Certainly the possibilities of that most coronaviruses that we know of are of origin from, that have infected the population, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, uh, generally come from an animal origin. um, And- Are there um, any other possibilities? Certainly a lab-based origin is one possibility. Okay. Yeah, it's a big deal. That's the head of the CDC right there. Um, So yesterday we kicked off the show talking about the lab leak theory and we made four points. First, more and more scientists are saying that this is a possibility that need to be investigated. Uh, we talked about a State Department memo that was sent in 2018 uh, from Beijing saying, hey, this lab is not safe. Uh, we talked about following the money and following the power. Those were our four points, and you can find that on yesterday's show. But as we were talking about it, I was just having all these flashbacks to how you were called an absolute idiot if you ever even suggested that maybe this leaked out from the, I don't know, biosafety level four lab that does coronavirus gain of function experiments on bats in Wuhan. Crazy, crazy <laughs> concept. Drew Holden is here. He's a um, freelancer, and you've seen him in National Review and, and Federalist and, and all these other places. Drew, how are you, brother? Mike, I'm doing well, sir. Uh, I'm, Good, I'm relieved that this story has finally, I think, had the cover blown off a bit. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and it's it really interesting psychology as to why it, yeah. it has taken so long. Uh, but let's go back in time first. You did a wonderful thread as to how uh, these conspiracy theorists were treated by the media. What do you remember the most? Sure. So, you know, I think what really jumps out to me was there was a, a piece in the Washington Post back in January of 2020. So before there's even a pandemic, before this really this really goes the way that obviously the last 14, 15 months have gone, where Tom Cotton had suggested that there was a possibility, certainly not a certainty, but a possibility that the coronavirus that we were seeing in China could have leaked from this level four biosafety lab that exists right down the street in Wuhan. And the Washington Post said that merely suggesting that that was a possibility was fanning the embers of a conspiracy theory that had been repeatedly debunked by experts. And I remember I reread those words the other day after obviously a lot of the narrative has changed. We've seen a lot of experts come out and say, hey, we need a lot more information about this. Even the World Health Organization saying, hey, we need China to put their cards on the table on these sorts of things. And I reread those words and I thought, my goodness, that aged poorly. Wow, amazing. I love the repeatedly debunked by experts. Yeah. And this was when? This was in January of 2020. So this was 
Again, it didn't even have time before, to be debunked. Exactly, exactly. But the great thing too was it wasn't it wasn't the last time that this would happen, right? NPR in April said the same thing that Cotton and Trump and Pompeo had floated these ideas that had been debunked, had been dismissed, and it's it, it's insane to me, right, to think that even if there even if there wasn't enough evidence, right, there are some people who who had said that back then. Fine, fair. But to go all the way to say that it was a conspiracy theory or that it had been debunked, it, it is inconceivable to me that one could look at the absence of evidence we had back then and draw a strong conclusion like that. And yet everyone managed to do it. Amazing. Uh, real quick, uh, and, and we talked about this in greater detail on yesterday's show, uh, one of the great debunkings was in a letter in The Lancet, which is a medical journal, mm -hmm. that was uh, written by this guy, Dr. Desik, D-E-S-Z-E-K or something like that, yep. who's the head of EcoHealth Alliance, who was given $3.7 million <laughs> by the National Institute of Health right. and then gave $600,000 to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Mm -hmm. He had a very strong incentive to make it clear that it did not come from a lab that he funded for bat coronavirus research. Is that accurate? Absolutely, yeah, that's that's entirely accurate. And it's not just even in the, the specific and the narrow of his own personal reputation or anything like that. I mean, one of the other big concerns in all of this is that he has to, in many respects, be responsive to the needs of the Chinese Communist Party. If he is doing research there, these are the people who are responsible for giving him the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And so the fact that he's got to have all of these considerations in the back of his head is another thing that, for whatever reason, we haven't found a way to talk about over the last year. Mm. What, do you, what do you make of the, uh, the fact that these reporters, journalists, mm. were – why were they so knee-jerk? I mean, was it just pure politics? Was it pure Trump, pure anti – because they hate, obviously, Tom Cotton. Yeah. Um, is that all that motivated this? I don't, I don't think so. So I think that was a, a huge driving force. I think the, um, the insistence that if Trump says something that we cannot neatly fit into existing evidence, it has to be wrong, was a huge driver of this. But I think the other knee-jerk reaction is that there's, there's a little bit of a defensive crouch, I think, in all of these, these posts, these commentaries, these write-ups about what happened, because there is, a, a, I think, an unwillingness from a lot of journalists and a lot of outlets to really take on China in a good and meaningful way. And they get, um, I think they get a little bit hung up when it comes to saying things that could reflect poorly on China. One, access issues, I'm sure, come to mind. But two, all of this is mixed up in anti-Asian bias and violence against Asian Americans and all these other conversations. So I think the hesitancy to, to, to call balls and strikes on anything that touches China was also a really big driver of this. Wow, so it's like woke. That's why Nancy Pelosi said, come on out to Chinatown. It's great. Come exactly. on, everyone the, the health department in New York City is like, come to the parade, Chinese New Year. It's wonderful. Bingo. I remember yep. Italy had hug a Chinese day. Hug a Chinese day, <sighs> Drew. Unbelievable, yeah. What is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hug it's, a it's Chinese a, day. Yes, right, right. And it's, I think one of the one of the other reasons that it's so absurd, there's a, a, a letter from, I think it was 14 or 18 leading virologists in Science Magazine recently where, they came out and said, and one of their big points was, listen, just being critical of research being done in China is not racist. It's absurd to call it racist. And that if we if we actually want to combat things like bias and concerns and everything else, then what we need to do is use the same measuring stick everywhere. And if we're not willing to do that, we're not going to get the answers that we need. Drew, awesome to talk to you, man. Let's do it again. Uh, Drew pleasure, Holden 360 on the Twitter. Thanks, brother. Uh, all right, everyone, tomorrow, our special on uh, critical race theory in schools and how to stop it at your kid's school. It's tomorrow. True story. Mike Slater, Spread the Board.